Hello, dear viewers. Welcome to my channel, Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about synthetic elements. So let's dive right into it. Well, first, we have to understand what we are talking about here is basically does not occur naturally on Earth. It's not something that we can mine. It's not like some alloy or it's not something ore like where you can just mine it and refine it and tada, you got your element. It does not flat out exist. That's what classifies it as synthetic element. On top of that, it is created by fundamentally manipulating the particle level. What does that mean? That simply means basically if you take a matter, let's say a block of iron or block of aluminum, you go down to its fundamental level, you reach uh, basically atoms you cannot go down below atom because if you go down below atoms you break all its property it no longer behaves like aluminum basically one electron from let's say hydrogen behaves the same as a uh, electron from iron it's exactly the same same happens uh, with uh, new neutrons and protons so fundamentally you have to go to the same level as atoms do not go below that so when we are talking about artificial elements it must happen on an atomic level not below that so uh, synthetic, uh, basically synthetic elements get their total nucleon counts basically what we put on a, a periodic table uh, based on their protons plus uh, neutrons and you have to understand this aspect basically periodic table is generally filled with isotopes those are most abundantly found basically in case of carbon there are many uh, isotopes of carbon but the most common one would be uh, denoted on a periodic table but when you are talking about synthetic when we are building it uh, there is a different kind of criteria to that that criteria area is basically uh, basically to nucleon count would be proton plus nu uh, neutron that's obvious but the basically let's say assume you made five isotopes of said element the longest living one will get the uh, basically certification on periodic table that's the whole criteria of it, it does not matter whether like like if you produce it and 90 percent of the time the most common one is this one and something that lives longer the lives longer one will always get on the periodic table that's the kind of requirement here so that's what we are talking about here now, one thing you always have to understand uh, whenever you're talking about synthetic elements is basically half-life. What does that mean? That simply means you have to think of a matter as a basically quote-unquote condensed form of energy. So the, every uh, matter, even hydrogen, will decay over time. However, that time is way too long. So we do not calculate it. It's like a bit too ludicrous. To give you an example, what kind of ludicrous timeline we are talking about here? Uh, bismuth is a kind of a weird element in this regard. It has 20 billion billion years before it reaches its half-life. Billion billion. 20. So ludicrously long number. So yes, hydrogen also has that, but that number is bonkersly long. So for a fundamental reason, we do not count that. We call them into stable category. Now, different isotopes have different lifespan. Now, this is a very critical aspect to understand. When somebody is comparing basically, let's say carbon to um, nitrogen, that's not a fair comparison because you have to specify which isotope to give you a context of that. Uh, let's say you take carbon. Carbon is generally, we have C6 carbon, but right now, we, as of now, uh, we know around 15 uh, known isotopes of carbon exist. What does that mean? Uh, matter well you take for example c14 that has a half-life of 5730 years uh, that's stable like let's say you are utilizing that for some kind of power generation and some kind of reactor uh, that, that's a long uh, lived system but let's say you took something different you're like hey i'm gonna use c11 basically 11 variety uh, 11th isotope and that has a half-life of 20 minutes so that's the whole point and you could literally find crisscrossing of this all over the periodic table where it's like do this element in stable form it outlasts the unstable one or uh, some isotope will have completely different behavior so you always have to pay attention to the isotope not just element isotope matters at this scale in time so elements have atomic number greater than 99 basically you take uh, a nucleon numbers and keep adding 99 99 neutron numbers you reach a point where they are fundamentally unstable no matter what we do they do not last so you take something you add neutron to it you take uh, basically uranium you keep adding on to it by the time you reach 99 everything you create after that point it fundamentally does not last the half-life reaches millisecond nanosecond femtosecond basically good luck trying to figure it out and forget about like having something like uh, some other uh, isotopes where we utilize some very interesting isotopes on our watch to replace radium so it glows in the dark without radioactive side effects so that's the whole uh, aspect of it half-life is very critical and to give you mathematical simplicity so think of it this way if half-life is of something is let's say uh, 10 hours so it does not mean it will go from uh, in 20 hours it will go so it will go from 100 to 50 50 to 25 25 to 12 12 to 6 6 to 3 so that's the whole thing you always have to understand always halves on itself it never goes like okay 50 percent gone 50 percent gone 50 done. 
it will not do like that so 100 50 half of that 25 half of that 12 half of that 6 half of that 3 percent so be mindful of that and you can easily find that in military watches which utilizes tritium as a glow system basically after 11 years technically you're supposed to replace them because again they will no longer have the peak brightness but it's only at 50 percent power and they still have like 25 percent life left so it's up to you again if you have good eyesight you can keep utilizing it as low as six percent so that's up to you that's why we have to understand half-life now how the heck we do this thing how the heck we take element that does not exist and make them into realities like okay this is on mathematical paper this is what we're supposed to get how the heck we make it well simple reality these are a high energy event now if you take nuclear physics you will understand this simple thing fusion and fusion is the fundamental creation of everything fusion specifically uh, so you take hydrogen you fuse it into uh, basically helium you take helium you fuse it into heavier elements like uh, let's say carbon then you take that you fuse it to basically oxygen then you take that nitrogen you keep going up until you reach iron and by the time you reach iron star goes boom and when that boom event happens that's the interesting part because that is such a high energy event like if you take a star its lifetime it barely fulfills like five or ten elements in a periodic table but at the moment at that instant of supernova it goes all out it goes all bonkers and at that ludicrously high energy levels all heavy elements are created basically anything heavier than iron so you get the point like that is very high energy event uh, that is required to create something like that now how the heck humans create supernova well we don't but on small scale we do have nuclear reactors or nuclear explosion both of them like uh, one hydrogen explosion helped humanity find einsteinium i'm not joking that's the actual name of element uh, so because uh, nuclear reactors and uh, basically boom events they are inherently same thing they are just happening on a smaller scale so that's one way of doing that however that's a very blunt use of energy but if you want to do that very directly it's like let's not uh, create gigawatts of energy just to utilize uh, like, you know milliwatts of it we utilize what we call particle accelerator so basically you take something uh, simple or something more stable for example you take calcium and you combine it with californium yes that's a name uh, and you come bang them each other now to do that you need a particle accelerator now one thing you have to understand atom on an atomic scale it's mostly empty space it's like 99.999 percent empty space so if you take two uh, basically blocks of matter and you throw them at each other they're just gonna pass through they're just gonna pass through each other so to make sure you uh, and you might be like okay why don't we throw a big matter when we can guarantee simply because we will not able to accelerate it fast enough so if we had magical energy source we are like gg amount of power we'll just throw a block of wood and that will work but point is if you want to accelerate it at relativistic velocity uh, where it's gonna actually overcome one very serious barrier basically nucleons of two atoms do not like to uh, you know bond together they do not like to do this and you have to make sure they do this so how the heck we do we have to use energy and that's the problem if you use two very big blocks uh, the energy repulsion energy is hard enough that's gonna shatter now if you reduce that like let's say make a thin film things can go across but problem would be most of the time even if you found a collision event the collision event will just like bounce back you do not want that. that's not stable element to achieve stable element you have to increase the energy level and that's what all the matter creator reactors do fundamentally speaking they are just particle accelerator that is smashing uh, something that you want to accelerate to something that is not moving and you hope you pray you bombard it to your full potential and you hope that nucleus on nucleus event happens and they bond because most of all, if the angle is not 90 degree, it will like, twing, twing. you don't want that. So that's a very difficult thing to do. And then comes the second problem. The moment you are talking about heavy elements like uh, osmium that is 294, then uh, livermonium that is 290 and fermium that is 286. All these things happen in a fraction of a second. For example, half-life is 0.7 millisecond, 8 millisecond, 125 millisecond. They are not even whole seconds at this point in time. So this is thing you have to understand when you are trying to study these sort of thing you have to study the decay you're never gonna study basically livermonium you're never gonna study that all you're gonna study is its decay particles it's like how the heck it decayed and based on that you have to create a model and based on that some other researchers have to replicate your research and then prove you have created an element these are not stable puppies and seconds are too long for these like heck you go to a scientist like i have livermonium and it is like you know it's gonna stay there for let's say two seconds or five seconds they're like Shut up and take my money but reality is microseconds so that's the process of creating however if you are uh, basically light elements you can do that and heavy elements is the issue so what are the actual use of it for example some light element use is uh, americium uh, that is 95 
used in smoke detectors now this is old system again we are trying to remove heavy radiation uh, sources from our life so that's a you know old thing but it still has some medical use then we have uh, chrysium that is 96 it is used in x-ray spectrometers now i always find it like what's the actual use of it think of it this way you sent your space probe to asteroid asteroid does not have its own x-ray source and you do not have enough electrical energy to create a x-ray flashlight how the heck you gonna study the object Ta-da! Now, there is another fancy name thing, Californium, that is a 98. Now, this is a very strong neutron emitter. Now, what's the use of it? Well, short answer, everything. For example, if you want to study a building, let's say this building has concrete foundation. It's solid, it's robust. How the heck are you going to scan through it? You can't send x-rays, it will not pass through. Neutrons, I got this. You can easily study it based on neutrons. Uh, let's say you want to basically figure out what is the humidity sense level of uh, water table that is below ground, like very below ground. Neutron, I got this. That's the whole point of it. It's a neutron source. It's up to you how the heck you're going to utilize it. Some utilize it for medical purposes where they target it in a human body and blow apart uh, basically what we call tumors. So it's a very targeted uh, use. If you know what you are doing with this, this is a very useful tool. If you don't know, again uh, health hazard and sometimes they are used as a igni igniters for reactors but the moment you start to go heavier number like that was 95 96 98 the moment you start to reach 99 everything you create at this point in time they do not have uh, half lives that are useful their half life is like millisecond a millisecond nanosecond femtosecond so fundamentally it becomes useless after that point in time so what we can expect in the future now you have to understand this we are creating elements. It's basically Iron Man 2. It's just like uh, people are going there, they are building particle accelerator and voila, we have a new element. It's like, that's a real thing. That's a real thing we humans are doing. So the more we do it, the better our fundamental science understanding goes. Like, and this level, uh, we humans, like uh, basically for our schooling system, we simplified a periodic table to like, oh, this is a periodic table. In real life, it's a giant graph, which has like multiple variation, multiple isotopes of that. Now, if you draw that out, basically in two axes, it's like, you know, heavier and uh, longer lift and like, you know, heavy and heavy. basically you need two axes for drawing it. You will find that there is a pattern to it. Like same way there is a pattern in periodic table, there is a pattern in all elements with all their isotopes, basically how long they live, there is a pattern to it. Now, thankfully, uh, we started to draw it out. And once we started to fill it up, we realized there is a pattern. Now that pattern is very interesting. Man. There is a mythical stability island. Basically, once we start to go heavier and heavier, we know for a fact, our math is telling us that, hey, if you start to go above 99, good luck finding anything that even lasts one second. Forget about like, you know, picking it out and putting a reactor, forget about that. However, what if the pattern repeats the pattern like because again mathematically we have some uh, basically what do you call guess is that there should be something once we push beyond a point it will become stable again so the elements that will create at those super high levels those will be stable what is the benefit of that we don't know that literally we do not know we may be making vibranium we may be making whatever tony stark made we don't know like that's fundamentally unknown we do not know what we can uh, achieve at that point in time however one thing is definitely guaranteed it's like it's uh, for uh, like it's allowing us to build much better tools allowing us to utilize uh, basically high energy events for much more precisely and we do not know what we can do with that it's like we are building the tools next generation 10 generations from now they will utilize the tool to do something awesome it's like laser was built by someone who did not even knew what the cd dvd blu-ray will ever happen for example einstein did that so that's the whole thing. We do not know what will happen. So somebody build the tools, somebody builds an element. Maybe tomorrow in the future, somebody figure out, hey, if we utilize that uh, rare element that we have to make and uh, we put that in a reactor on a fusion reactor, uh, basically fusion reactor, Tada! the fusion reactor becomes easy to ignite. Right now, the ignition is very difficult or sustaining the ignition. So we may be like, hey, just few, pour a few atoms of it, it will stabilize the reaction. We do not know. Or heck, we may figure out something that directly does a neutronic reaction, which is needed for Iron Man's chest reactor. Again, voila, magical system. But at that point in time, it will be more like a battery rather than a reactor. But again, it will be very use, uh, awesome use of basically chemical battery. So we do not know what we can expect in the future. We may figure out awesome things, but one thing is definitely sure we're going to understand much, much more. It's like we, we are going from like, you know, caveman to actually creating matter. Vibranium, here we come. So this was my presentation on synthetic elements. I hope you liked it, learn from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends, that will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free, and as always, thanks for watching.